Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to, and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren. En de Bali is zo'n plek. Goedenavond, dames en heren. Warm welcome to everybody. My name is Juri Albrecht. I'm the director of the Bali. And it's a great pleasure to uh, be able to welcome you here. Also the watchers at home. Because you're one of the lucky ones. Because you understand that it's important to be in person at a place where there is something going on. Um, there, where there is a meeting, a gathering of people. There are many people on the internet, though, looking uh, as well. So a warm welcome to them as well. And a very, very warm welcome to Timothy Snyder. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome him, to welcome you again here for the third time in, I think, three years we just established. Um, Timothy Snyder is one of the most rigorous, forward-thinking intellectuals of our time. I think it's truly awe-striking that he's here, that he's willing to talk uh, uh, from a few notes for uh, uh, the, the, in, in this evening about our time, um, the road to unfreedom. Uh, reminiscence to uh, the road to serfdom, I would say, from Friedrich von Hayek. Uh, he's, I think he's in that league. I think it's a, a great honor that he's here. It's wonderful to have been working together uh, with John Adams Institute, with Tracy. Uh, thank you for working together so well. Um, uh, it's wonderful that Ambo Antos uh, joined us as well in organizing this evening. Thank you very much, Ambo Antos, for um, um, helping us. And thanking, thank you, John Adams Institute, for working together with the Bali. I'd like to um, uh, uh, give the floor to Ilko Bos van Rosenthal, and I can't see where he is now, actually, but he's somewhere here. Yeah, he's there. Um, uh, who is going to introduce our speaker of tonight and who is going to moderate the evening. Ilko, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you. And um, thanks a lot to Professor Snyder as well, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm a reporter for Nieuwsuur, as we can have all read in the book. Um, the foreword, according to Mr. Snyder, reporters are the heroes of our time. Who am I to take issue with that? Um, thanks for being here. Uh, Judy said a, a, a little bit about um, uh, Mr. Snyder's reputation. Let me add what uh, the renowned historian Yuval Noah Harari, the author of Homo Deus, has said about this book. He calls it a brilliant and disturbing analysis. Does this still work? Yeah. Um, which should be read by anyone wishing to understand the political crisis currently engulfing the world um, about this book, The Road to Unfreedom. While I briefly introduce Professor Snyder further, I'd like to begin with a picture of the celebration of the past weekend, 100 years after the peace uh, of the, uh, the Great War. Um, the, the pictures can obviously be, be distorting. This picture made it to the uh, newspapers across the world, um, but it does fit an, a, a certain narrative, at least I'm going to use it for my narrative. Um, we see the back of President Putin's head, obviously uh, some people, you don't see Prime Minister Rutte, I'm sure he's thinking about MH17, he's in the back, um, but, but also Merkel and Macron, they are looking with, well, I guess everybody has to define it for themselves, if it's amazement or disgust, or at least they're very wary about him. There's one person laughing, and Donald Trump doesn't laugh a lot. I've been watching this guy for a couple of years quite intensively, and he doesn't smile very often. Um, he is smiling here. The narrative which this fits is the axis of illiberalism. Um, if there is such an axis, these two world leaders, Trump and Putin, and Professor Snyder um, can talk a lot better and more about this than I can. 
Um, but, but these two may be the poles of that um, illiberal axis. Um, even though the, the, the pillars of American democracy, I think, uh, although shaken, are still standing. Um, but maybe you disagree and we'll get to that in a minute. We'll most likely spend more time today discussing uh, President Putin than President Trump. Um, but let me just briefly point out uh, at, at the past week some of the things that President Trump has said or done in the days after the midterms. Because when we talk about democracy and the pillars of democracy, it's, it's quite important. He fired his attorney general um, because he didn't feel that this attorney general was protecting, protecting him enough. Um, he didn't feel the loyalty that he expected of his attorney general at a time that he is under investigation for his own, um, for his own dealings. At the same time, he denied um, a correspondent for the most important TV network in, in the US, CNN. He denied him access to the White House because, in the end, just because he was posing questions which the president uh, did not like. Um, then he pushed election officials in two states, this was days after the midterms, in Arizona and Florida, to stop counting the votes. Um, because he said that other election officials were rigging the votes. Um, these are all things that... I'd like to give the floor to... These are things that I did not expect to see happen in the US, let, let's say two years ago. Maybe I'm naive. There's one person who was not naive, and that was Timothy Snyder. Um, I interviewed Professor Snyder here about two years ago, and then last April or of 2017 in his office in, um, in, in Yale. This was after the first 100 days of the Trump administration, and a few months before, I think, even before the inauguration, you published your uh, book on tyranny, which, um, well, which predicted many of the things we've seen uh, since. During our interview in, in, uh, in April of 2017, this was for Newsweek, the program I work for, uh, Professor Snyder said, and I'm reading from notes, in Trump's mind there is no rule of law, there's no constitutional system. The architecture of his mind is clear when he says journalists are enemies, when he attacks judges, etc. He imagines an America without a constitutional system. And what also stayed with me was Professor Snyder's warning that if we think this won't happen here, if we think it doesn't fit the general course of history, we are very wrong since there is no general course of history. Um, we've seen the rise of nationalist parties. We've seen the longing for a strong leader, the Brazilian president-elect Jair Bolsonaro being the latest example of that. Um, and I think we need somebody like Professor Snyder not only to interpret this, but perhaps uh, also show us the way out. I hope so, because otherwise this evening is going to end in misery. Um, I will sit down with Professor Snyder in about half an hour, uh, pose him a couple of questions, but there will be plenty of room for audience questions uh, right from the start. Um, and also let me stress that after the event, which will be in about an hour and a half, Professor Snyder will sign books. Um, books will also be for sale if you didn't bring your copy, and that will all be uh, in the lobby. But for now, let's give uh, a warm hand to Professor Snyder to discuss his book. Thanks. So what, what happened to the future? Where, where did the future go? I was talking about this book a couple of weeks ago in Bratislava to a, a very young audience, mostly university students. And at the end of the question and answer session, one of the students asked, what was it like to grow up with the future? <laughs> and growing up in the 1970s and 1980s, I can remember what it was like to grow up with the future. And I think it may be the most astonishing um, characteristic of our own political moment that we don't have a future. That is, 
We all have, I'm not trying to fulfill the prophecy of the introduction and make you very depressed. I believe that you will all walk out of this hall alive, that you will go home to your children or your goldfish or whatever it is. I don't mean you don't have a future in that sense. I mean that it's hard to think of a moment in modern history when thinking about the future has been so impoverished, where politics has been so much about the risks of the present and lies about the past. We've got ourselves backed into a kind of dead end where politics is either about defending a present that needs to be improved instead, or about telling lies about a past that never happened. So what I'm trying to do in this book, in The Road to Unfreedom, is to get at this question of the rise of authoritarianism at that deeper level. I'm trying to ask what comes before politics? What are the things that we take for granted that form how we think about politics and how we behave politically? And then what happens when all of those assumptions, when our implicit systems of thought break and something else happens that surprises us? This is how I'm trying to characterize the present moment because the present moment is strange. It's not just that democracy is retreating, which it is. It's not just that authoritarianism is consolidating, which it is. It's that we're constantly surprised, right? It's not just that Mr. Trump is an authoritarian, which he is. It's that he's strange. He's uncanny, right? The fact that we keep talking about things being unpredictable is itself a sign that something has gone very strangely wrong. Because how smart can we be if we're constantly being surprised, what does it mean that we're constantly being surprised? So I start out this book by talking about time precisely. What happened to the future? What I'm, the claim that I'm trying to make, the claim with which I begin the book, is that for the past 25 or 30 years, many of us in the West have been living inside an idea, an idea of time that felt like life itself. Because of course, this is the thing about ideas. When you really believe ideas, they seem like life. They seem like reality. You don't see the outside of them because you're inside of them. And one of the great ironies, I think, of the period after 1989 is that many of us shrugged our shoulders and said, history is over. There are no alternatives. The only ideas left are liberalism and democracy. And we didn't notice that that itself was an idea an idea over which, which we could choose to accept or choose to reject. It's this idea in the book that I call the politics of inevitability. The idea that we know the future because the future is going to be like the present, but better. Um, the notion of progress, to put it in one word, that we don't have to ask what's good because we know the present is good, the future is just going to have more of the good things that we have in the present. Time is like a line going forward and upward to a point that we know. That's the politics of inevitability. Now, the problem with the politics of inevitability is that it crashes, it breaks. At, at different times in different places, whether it's in northern France or whether it's in West Virginia, whether it's in central Russia, at different times in different places, this notion of progress, this notion that we know the future based on the present has crashed for different people at different times, but for different reasons, but it's crashing. And now I think it has crashed. I think we've now reached the point that very few people believe in this idea anymore. Um, and what's rushed in to replace it is something else. Another version of time, more dangerous, which I call the politics of eternity. And this is what I think all of these different kinds of authoritarians, it's so nice that you get to drink beer like that. <laughs> That's just, yeah, cheers. I mean, that's civilization right there. Um, the, uh, it's, it, the, the, so all of these things, if you're looking for something they all have in common, Trump, Putin, Brexit, Front National, Alternative for Deutschland, Orban, Kaczynski, it, it, they, seem, they seem different, and they are, but one thing that they all have in common is this thing that I call the politics of eternity. That is, using a notion of the past where we are good and they are bad because we are inside and they are outside. And the thing that happens over and over again is that they come for us. 
and we're good because we're us and they're bad because they're them. And the same thing happens over and over again in history. This is also a view of time. Like the politics of inevitability, it's a view of time which pretends to be history, but which actually crushes history, which takes actual history completely out of the picture. What the politics of, inevi of eternity enables is a kind of politics of us and them, where, and this is where we are now, the future completely disappears. What the politicians of eternity do is they loop back to a past which never happened a or a past which can't be regained. I'll go into detail about this in a moment, but they do this in a postmodern way with postmodern technology. So a, Mr. a Trump, for example, talks about making America great again. Oh, and incidentally, what does social science tell us about when America was great? If you ask Americans when America was great, it predictably turns out to be when the American in question was young. And you know, we can disagree or agree about what the state can do, but one thing that the state cannot do is make you young again, <laughs> right? I mean, like that's, like that's the, that is the classic, I see some disappointed looks. <laughs> Um, perhaps we have some billionaires in the audience who really believe in the immortality thing. All right, we can talk about that later. Um, the, but, so the, the, what the politics of eternity does is that it simultaneously loops you back into an imagined past, and there's a small daily loop, the technological loop, the tweet in Mr. Trump's case, where every day you're elated or you're crushed by emotion, by technologically generated emotion, which makes it very hard for you to think about the future. You're thinking about the present, right? So the politics of eternity has a big loop back into an imagined past, but it also has a daily loop, the news cycle, the way that we're prevented from thinking about the future because we're constantly, and this is Mr. Trump's genius, right? We're constantly shocked, surprised, humiliated, whatever it might be by something that he did that day. Right? He runs the White House as if it were a television program in that very specific sense. Now, these are ideas. And the move that I make at the beginning of The Road to Unfreedom is that I insist that ideas matter, which is a very old-fashioned, I know, conservative way to start a book. Um, my, my publishers, um, my excellent Dutch publishers from Envo Anthos are here. They did not encourage me to start this book by spending 30 pages on a dead Russian philosopher that no one has heard of. But I did it because I think it's true that ideas matter. I think it's true that ideas from the 1920s and 1930s are coming back. I think it's interesting that President Putin of Russia had the corpse of this fellow reburied. I think it's telling that he found where his papers were. The philosopher's name is Ivan Ilin. That, he, that Putin found out where the papers were and brought them back to Russia. I think it's interesting that Mr. Putin lays flowers on the philosopher's grave. Uh, I think it's telling that Mr. Putin cites this particular philosopher at, at pretty much every relevant occasion. But the reason why it's interesting for me is that this philosopher is an example of the politics of eternity. What Eileen says is, Russia is always innocent, the outside world is always guilty. Democracy should be a ritual in which a leader who comes from outside of history has his power consolidated and reaffirmed. And interestingly, and this is where the fascist past links up with the postmodern present, interestingly, this philosopher Eileen also says, nothing about the world we live in is true. The only truth for Eileen is God, um, and God can only, be, it's a long story, he wrote 40 books, so I'm gonna give it to you in one sentence. Yes, <laughs> this is in the I read it so you don't have to category. Um, God, the only good is God's integrity. Um, God, God's integrity has been broken. The only place God can be restored is in Russia. And therefore, since the only truth is God, Facts don't matter, right? These things that we think of as facts, they're not true. The only truth is God, and the only way to God is Russia. Hence, lying in the service of Russia is serving the truth, you see? It's right to lie in the service of Russia. And this is where the fascism, a Christian fascism, links up with a postmodern attitude towards truth, which is that facts are what we choose to call them. There are alternative factualities, there are, there are alternative views. There's no truth out there, it's not worth looking for them. Now, 
This is very important because this gets us to the way that the Russian politics of eternity work. Why is Russia so important? Is Russia important because Russia is so different? Because Russia isn't like an alien power which somehow magically chose the American president? Is Russia important because it's an alien power which somehow magically determines the outcomes of Dutch referendums? Is Russia important for these reasons? No, Russia is important because Russia represents a possible line of development that we are all participating in and which Russia itself is encouraging us to follow. It's a line of development which shows how you can govern from what I'm calling eternity. It shows how you can govern without a future. And because we are all moving into that world where we can't think about the future, the, the fact that Russia has been governed from this futureless point for about a decade now is very significant. Now, so putting it a different way, we used to think that what happened in the West mattered for the East. And it did for about a decade. But for about a decade, it's been the other way around. What matters in the East actually happens, matters for us, not only at the level of wars, like the invasion of Ukraine, which is profoundly important for us, and I'll get to it, but also at the level of ideas. Ideas that emerge in, in, in Russia turn out to be much more important in the middle of the United States than we would have anticipated. Okay, so why is Russia, why did Russia reach this place first? Because this is the argument of the book. The argument of the book is that Russia matters because Russia got to the politics of eternity first and is bringing the rest of us along. So why is there no future in Russia? Or, I mean, to be precise about this, um, why is it impossible to talk about the future in political terms in Russia? First of all, because Russia is a hydrocarbon oligarchy. By hydrocarbon, I mean natural gas and oil, right? So like Saudi Arabia, like a number of other states, Russia is a hydrocarbon oligarchy. And if you are a hydrocarbon oligarch, you do not like to talk about the future because the future is global warming and it's your fault. So whether you are the Koch brothers in America or whether you're Vladimir Putin in Russia, the future is not your topic for that reason. Second reason why the future is gone in Russia is radical inequality. So um, there's a radical left-wing organization called Credit Suisse, um, which issues annually a wealth report, a kind of love letter, actually it is. And in the Credit Suisse annual wealth report, um, America is number two in wealth inequality. Uh, you have one guess as to which country is number one, right? The Russian Federation. When there is extreme inequality of wealth, it is very hard for people to change their social and economic status. Extreme, one of the bad things about wealth inequality is that it leads to a lack of social mobility. When people can't change their social and economic positions, they don't have a future, right? They don't have a future different than the present. That's the second reason after hydrocarbons that Russia is a futureless political system. And the third reason is the problem of succession. So what's the problem of succession? The problem of succession is how you keep your state going when a leader becomes sick or dies or is overthrown. This is the central problem of politics, right? We have solved this problem with a little thing we like to call democracy. You know, or, or we, we're now struggling to say why democracy is a good thing. I've got lots of reasons why democracy is a good thing, but one of them is that it allows the state to continue. <laughs> You see, we're in this interesting moment where we think authoritarianism is sexy because the, like these guys come in and break all the rules, right? This is what they have in common, the Putin, the Trump, you know, the, the Erdogan, they come in and they break the rules. And like, that's attractive. I don't, I don't get, like, I, I don't actually understand like the strange masculinity of all of this, but there's something about how breaking the rules is attractive. Now, that's interesting for a while, but the thing is, once you break the rules, once you break the rules of the state, once you don't know what comes next, once you actually get rid of the succession principle, you've created futurelessness for your own society, right? So in Russia, no one knows what's going to happen after Mr. Putin dies, and no one is allowed to talk about that. 
which is a proposition that you are welcome to test by going to Russia and holding up a sign which says, no one knows what will happen after Mr. Putin dies. You will not be able to do that for more than about 45 seconds if you're in a big city, because that is the deep, dark secret. And it is very deep and very dark. Authoritarianism seems attractive when it's all about challenging the system, right? But when it's about getting old and dying, and leaving your state in a, in, a, in, a, in a condition of distress, it's suddenly not so sexy anymore. That's the deep, dark secret of authoritarianism. It's also this, one of the secrets, by the way, of why democracy is such a good thing, is that it solves that problem to the point where we don't have to think about it anymore. So for these reasons, succession, inequality, and hydrocarbons, Russia has to govern from futurelessness. And the way that Russia governs from futurelessness is by way of mistrust. The way that Russia works is to take mistrust and turn it into something positive through which you can govern. And this is something what, which I think is new in the history of politics, and it's interesting. So what the Russian leadership says to its population is, you are correct not to trust us. We are, in fact, corrupt oligarchs. Our news is, in fact, not true. You know this. We know that you know this. And that is a new form of social contract. Fine, mistrust us, but if you mistrust us, mistrust everyone else too. And this is where the, it becomes foreign policy. If, you must, if you're going to mistrust us, your Russian leaders, you should also know that Dutch leaders and American leaders and British leaders and European leaders are just as much lying oligarchs as we are. And the next step, you should understand that Dutch journalism, European journalism, American journalism, or Dutch law, American law, European law, Dutch democracy, American democracy, European democracy is just as much a joke as ours, right? It's a joke everywhere, and we all know this. We smart people, we're in on this, we know it's all surfaces, it's all hypocrisy, right? We know this, we're in on it. That's what you have to accept. That's what governing from mistrust means, and that's a way you can govern without a future. Because if everybody everywhere really are just hypocritical, cynical, lying oligarchs, it's very hard to imagine that the world has much of a future which is different from the present. And so you can fall into the, oh, well, you know, the powerful are gonna be powerful, the ideas are all just masks for power, nothing really matters. And then the system of eternity wins. And so you'll notice that the way that Russia plays in foreign policy is not to say that Russia's good. I mean, they make some half-hearted efforts at that sometimes. If you know, Mr. Putin is forced into a corner, he will say something about how Russia's good, but that's not the way it generally works. The way it generally works is to say, other places are bad. And to say, you can't trust anybody. And that's the ultimate weapon, the spreading of mistrust. So the way that this is, becomes foreign policy is interesting. Because how, if, if this is how you need to govern, what do you want to do to the rest of the world? Well, you want to tell your population that the rest of the world is just like Russia, despite appearances. And you want to make the rest of the world more like Russia, which would seem like something very difficult to do. If, let's say, you're President Obama looking at the Russian Federation, you say, well, this is what Mr. Obama said, this is just a regional power, right? The conventional wisdom in, among our elite was, they don't make anything, therefore they don't have economic power, therefore they don't have any real power. But somehow they got to choose our president, um, which suggests that they did have a certain form of power, um, which is worth thinking about. So um, the, how you govern with mistrust is you not only try to convince your population that the world is just as cynical and hypocritical as we are, but you try to make the world that way. You try to push against European and American institutions. You try to take institutions which by their nature are going to be a little bit flawed and make them more flawed. You try to find people who don't really believe in the, in the institutions, like Mr. Trump. You try to find people who are willing to push ideas that are controversial, painful, and not true. Ideas whether they have to do with global warming denial or denying the efficacy of vaccination. You find those people and you support them as much as you can. You try to spread distrust. And above all, you try to spread the idea that there's not really any truth anyway. Who knows? You've got your opinion about vaccinations. I've got my opinion. You've got your opinion about global warming. I've got my opinion. In the end, who knows? It's all a matter of preferences. So. 
This is why Russia is so important. And this is how Russia links into the United States. Because what happened in the United States in 2016 is that Russia found ways of making us just a little bit more like them. And now we're becoming more like them every day, every week. There are very few things which Mr. Trump does which can't be classified either as undermining our institutions or, more fundamentally, undermining people's ability to trust in some kind of factual reality. Okay, so this gets me to the American version of the politics of inevitability. And this is going to be the fun part of the lecture for those of you who are not American, because this is going to be the part where we notice all the bad things about America and how the Americans really had it coming and how they really deserve it and they're dumb and so on. Okay, so this is going to be that part of the lecture. So yeah, perk up. Um, so the, the, the American, the Ameri <laughs> this is one of the many ways I can tell who the Americans are in the audience. Um, the other, the, well, I'll, I'll give, another is that you slouch. We slouch, I slouch too. Um, so the, the, the American politics of inevitability says this. It says, we won the Cold War, history came to an end, economics determines politics, which is actually a strange thing to say, right? After you win, you think Marxism is dead, and so you th say economics determines politics, right? But economics determines politics, capitalism brings about democracy, there are no alternatives. Oh, and technology is always enlightening. That's, that was our politics of inevitability. And there's a slightly more right-wing version, there's a slightly more left-wing version, but that's our politics of inevitability. Where that leads you, of course, is into a world where all of the gains in wealth and income in the United States in the last quarter century have been captured by a very small percentage of people, where uh, an American born today has a much less than 50% chance of making more money than his parents, an America where average life expectancy is going down, um, which is a shocking thing to be happening in, in the developed world, an America where the average citizen spends 11 hours a day in front of a screen, um, and an America where we have now seen just how the internet, or specifically certain parts of the internet, especially social platforms, lead people away from the ability to carry out rational discussion with fellow citizens and towards a politics of, of us and them. All of which, um, or much of which is, is, as it were, personified by Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump is the kind of American capitalist who survived by playing outside the rules. Um, and the way that he came to power has everything to do with the way the internet can be mobilized as a weapon of fear and anxiety. Um, also as a weapon of fear and anxiety used by foreigners. So um, the, the three main camp, Trump campaign slogans build the wall, lock her up, drain the swamp, were all tested by foreigners using Facebook before Mr. Trump even announced his candidacy, right? And incidentally, I mean, these things, these things have an incantatory, by the way, fascist, but an incantatory power, which has nothing to do with reality. They're not going to drain the swamp. They're going to be more corrupt. They're not going to lock her up. Her means Hillary Clinton because she hasn't committed any crimes they can prosecute her for. And they're not going to, they don't even have to build the wall. This is the interesting thing about postmodern fascism, right? Mr. Trump and the Republicans have been in power for two years. You can build a wall in two years. I mean, the United States of America could build a wall in two years, but we didn't. And the interesting thing is we don't have to. There doesn't have to be a real wall. There just has to be an incantation about a wall. So now they're talking about finishing the wall, but they haven't even started it, right? At the US-Mexican border, no, this is very American. At the US-Mexican border, there are like giant tile samples. You know how like when you're building your kitchen and like the fun thing to do is you go and pick out what color the tile is? That's what Mr. Trump does. He goes to the US-Mexican border and there are these giant tile samples set up vertically. And he like goes and inspects them. He says, oh yeah, I like that. And oh yeah, I mean, that one goes with the color of dead Mexicans. And that one goes with the color of a depressing sunset. You know, and that one kind of matches my tie, right? That's what he does. And no, I mean, this is an interesting thing about the United States of America. We don't, we're not building anything except rhetoric, right? People think we have, you know, th that's an interesting difference, by the way, between this fascism and the previous one. The previous fascism actually built things. Um, I mean, say what you want against it, and I'm happy to agree with all of it, but, I, I, but the, the previous fascism actually built things. 
in actually redistributed resources. The American fascism this time around doesn't do either of those things. This is one of the ones, anyway. So Mr. Trump um, is an example of, of, Mr. Trump is a very successful politician of eternity, making America great again, right? A cycle back to the past, and then the daily, the daily Twitter feed. And Russia fits into this because he's a natural for them. Right? He's, he's, very, he, he, he's somebody who fits very nicely into the way that, that Russians think the politics of the world should work and, and does work. But more importantly, the reason why the Russian campaign in 2016 was effective was because it played on very real issues in American life. So there's a reason why the Russian version of Republican Party websites were always more popular than the actual Republican Party websites. And that is that the Russians were willing to go further and provoke more and play on emotions a little bit more directly. There's a reason why Russian fictions were more effective than our fictions, because they don't care about us at all. But they're willing to use the things that we want to believe. So a lot of people don't like Hillary Clinton. But the notion that Hillary Clinton is a pedophile pimp um, running the prostitution ring out of a pizzeria basement is one that we actually needed foreign help to believe in. We got that foreign help at a critical time, right after a tape was revealed where Mr. Trump said that sexually assaulting women was fine. 45 minutes after that, we got the pizza story about Hillary Clinton, um, which, by the way, is a very good example of how the Russians got him into office. Because if, if you, what happened then is that a story which everybody thought was going to kill the Trump campaign is immediately canceled out by another story about how Hillary Clinton is even worse. And that's what people thought. A third of Americans believe the pizza pedophile prostitution story. One third of Americans believe that in October of 2016. Um, so so I, we won't go into all the details here, but you know, I'll give you a couple of interesting stats. 137 million Americans voted. 126 million Americans saw Russian material on Facebook. Right? Um, and, and one could go on. OK, so this is our politics of inevitability, right? Our politics of inevitability opens up inequality. It opens up vulnerabilities having to do with tech because we're terribly naive about how the internet actually works. And then these things can be used against us in a figure of something like Mr. Trump. Okay, that was, that, was, that was the good part. Oh, wait, there's one more part about the good part. Climate change. Climate change is very important. I said at the beginning that hydrocarbon oligarchs don't talk about the future because the future is climate change and it's their fault. Mr. Trump is very important here. There's a style of politics which is being practiced which goes like this. You talk about, for example, the migrants, the Mexican migrants, right? The Mexican migrants, they're terrible, they're rapists. That was his very first campaign speech. The Mexicans are rapists, the rapists are Mexicans. Um, he talks about the criminal immigrants, which is a trope which is familiar from Switzerland and elsewhere in Europe. You talk about this, but you don't talk about why it is that there's migration from the South. The reason why there's migration from the South is climate change. Not only do you not talk about that, in policy, you do everything you can to make climate change worse, right? So the very same people who make migration a political issue are the climate change deniers, which is incidentally very often true in, the, in Europe as well. Um, a number of influential politicians, especially in Central Europe, who talk about migrants are also climate change deniers. This, this policy goes together. Right? Because what you're doing is you're making a crisis worse, even as you're trying to define politics as the politics of us and them. So you're bringing a, a bad future closer all the time, and you're preparing for it by getting people into this politics of eternity. I wish it weren't that sinister, but it is. Okay, that was the good part. Um, that was the part you're supposed to feel good about, because like those Americans and the crazy things they do. The European politics of inevitability. Okay, this is the part where you don't get to feel so good. Um, the European politics of inevitability goes like this. It's just as complacent and just, in, just as crazy and just as wrong and just as dangerous. The European politics of inevitability says, we are old nations, we are wise, we've learned from experience. Um, and what we've learned is that war is bad. Um, we had two world wars, we've learned from them that war is bad. And unlike the Americans who just keep fighting these wars, we understand that war is bad, hence the European Union. That's the story. 
Um, everything about it is completely wrong. And for three generations, it hasn't mattered so much that it was completely wrong. But now that America is withdrawing, and now that Russia is posing a normative challenge to the European Union, it matters a great deal that your foundational story is completely wrong. How is it completely wrong? It's completely wrong because your nations are not that old, because the nation state has never existed in most of Europe, and because the real story in European history is how you get out of empire. That's the real story in Dutch history. That's the real story. There's not a Dutch nation state in modern history. There is an empire, and then there's integration. Those are the stages. And the great success of European Union is Europe, that Europe became the place to rest after empire. If you want to put it in a, a post-colonial way, the Europeans are privileged after empire because they can go home, right? No one else can go home. But the Europeans can go back and they can create the biggest economy in the history of the world. And then they can say to themselves, we are very wise because we learned that war was a bad thing. Our nations have learned over time that war was bad, which of course is complete nonsense. What happened was you lost a whole bunch of colonial wars and only then did you land in Europe, right? That's your actual history. It's not the one you teach your children, but that's your actual history. And it is now dangerous that you think this. This is your politics of inevitability. We always have a nation. We always have a nation state. The nation state learns. The nation state could choose to be in Europe or not. It'd be fine either way. No, right? What European history shows, at least if you're a conservative empirical historian, is that there have been two political alternatives in modern history for almost all of you, empire and integration. The nation state does not actually figure. It only figures in your imaginations. And then again, what you teach your children, which is why it's in your imaginations. This is a self-perpetuating cycle. And this means, in turn, that all of the debates from Brexit outwards are completely miscast. The Brexit debate says, is it a good thing or a bad thing for Great Britain to be inside the European Union? But there's never been a Great Britain. There's been a British, yeah, try to remember when there was a Great Britain because there never was one. There was a British empire and then there was Britain inside a European project, right? In the 60s, British, the, most of British trade shifts from being empire and commonwealth to being in, on the European continent. Not long at, thereafter, Britain becomes a member of the European, what was then the European community. There, there is no story of the nation state. You don't have one either. No one has one, or the ones, the European countries who do have one, places like Poland and Hungary or Estonia, that's not exactly an object lesson of how the nation state works, right? All of the nation states formed after the First World War, which was our great moment of national self-determination, were extinct 20 years later. All of them, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all the states that were created were then destroyed, right? And people used to remember that. So the, the historical achievement of Europe is that it's, it's unified former imperial metropoles and former imperial peripheries into units which pride themselves falsely on their long national histories and pride themselves falsely on having learned from history. That's the historical achievement of the European Union. And the reason why that matters is, to take the example of Brexit, just like Russia tempts Americans into the notion that we can be great again, Russia plays the same game or played the same game with Brexit. The Russian propaganda in Brexit was all along the same lines. You've always been independent. You've always been a great nation. You'd be fine without the European Union. Um, and by the way, the weapons were the same. So 20% of the Twitter conversation about Brexit was organized from abroad. 20%. And how many British citizens were aware of this at the time? 0%. And interestingly, it's very often the same Twitter accounts that were active on MH17, Brexit, and in the Trump campaign, because it's all fundamentally about the same thing. It's all fundamentally about moving us towards this thing that I'm calling the politics of eternity. So if you look at the way that Russia intervenes in European politics, it's symptomatic. There's a, there's a very interesting detail which gets overlooked, which is that Russia supports climate deniers, right? Interesting, Russia supports climate deniers, Russia supports opponents of the European Union, and Russia in general supports whatever will create informational chaos and make people distrust. So, bringing this to a close, the, 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 the lesson that we didn't learn, um, maybe some, I mean, I imagine since I'm in Amsterdam, some of you did, but in general, the, the test that we failed in all of this, the opportunity that we had to notice this that we didn't seize was Ukraine in 2014. That's where we blew it. 
In Ukraine in 2014, we had a chance to see how the politics of eternity works, and we didn't see it. In fact, we fell for it. Because what did we think about Ukraine? I mean, not all of you individually, personally, but in general in the West, what did we think? We thought it's about language, it's about culture, it's about lines on maps, it's about Russian speakers, it's about the conversion of Lodomir in 988, it's about the 18th century, it's about the Second World War. It wasn't about any of those things. None of those things had anything to do with it. What happened in Ukraine was that a serious part of the population, correctly understanding the history of the European Union, thought that Ukraine getting closer to the European Union would help Ukraine build a rule of law state. Correct. And as that movement was taking place, Russia invaded Ukraine. Pretty straightforward. Happens with some regularity in European history. One country invades another. But that's not how we processed it. Those are the, those, that's the fairly simple reality. But we process it in entirely different ways. Why? Because when you're inside the politics of inevitability, you want to think that there's a line of development and that the facts that seem to challenge that line of development, that those facts are somehow just irrelevant details, bumps in the road, they're marginal, they're peripheral, they're not the mainstream. So again, Mr. Obama saying Russia's a regional power, that's a way of dismissing something from the story. Or, um, I mean, Adam Golpnik, who's somebody I respect a lot, writing in The New Yorker saying, uh, History has never decided at the margins, it's decided at the center, right? You're just, just going to push this all to the side. A European country invades another European country. We're going to push that to the side. A European country annexes territory from another European country. Somehow it's not so important. It's all about, ah, what's it all about? It's about false ideas about the past, which are in the, when you're in the politics of inevitability, this is your vulnerability. What did the Russians say to the Dutch and the Europeans? They said, the Ukrainians haven't really understood the past, right? You good Europeans know that war is bad, but the Ukrainians haven't understood this. The Ukrainians, in fact, are fascists. They're Nazis. And then, then good Europeans can say, oh yes, well, Nazis, that's certainly a bad thing, and fascists, who would want to be on the side of the fascists, right? They push on your vulnerabilities consciously because they, the thing that I'm talking about, they would use different words, but the thing that I'm talking about, they understand. So what happens in Ukraine is telling, not just because it shows how we were vulnerable, but also because of the techniques. And you're here in Amsterdam, you're familiar with some of the techniques, right? So the technique of clustered fictions is the technique which was used around MH17. So what happened was pretty straightforward. Russia invaded Ukraine. Russian soldiers and officers commanding a Russian unit and Russian weapons shot down a civilian airliner, leading to the mass murder of 289 people. That's actually pretty straightforward. And the evidentiary trail was pretty clear on day one with what actually happened. But rather than saying, oh, we invaded the country and we accidentally shot down a civilian airline and we're sorry, what the Russian leadership did was create a cloud of fictions around the event. Interestingly, and this shows how intelligent they are, by the way, they never directly denied what happened. They never directly denied the fact. They never said the opposite of what happened. They just said a bunch of other things, like it was NATO, or the Ukrainians were trying to shoot down President Putin's jet, or Ukrainians were testing ground air missiles, or Ukrainian fighter pilots were in the area, or a Ukrainian Jewish oligarch is in charge of Ukrainian airspace and it was somehow his fault. These, oh, or the CIA launched a plane full of corpses from Amsterdam and there was never anybody alive on the plane, right? And these things were not meant to, yeah, you can't know whether to laugh or cry, right? I cry is what I would vote for. But the, the point of this kind of discussion is to first make it impossible to see the obvious truth, and the truth was pretty obvious, honestly. But second, to make the event itself somehow irrelevant, right? Because when there are so many versions of fiction around an event, somehow the simple thing that people died who shouldn't have died gets lost from view, and somehow Russia becomes the victim. Right? So more than 80% of the Russian population believes that Russia was the victim of MH17 because the West conspired to create the story about what's not true. So that's one tactic. Another tactic is total denial of reality, which has spread from Russia to the United States. When Russia invades Ukraine, one of the confusing things is the president of Russia says, oh, we didn't invade Ukraine. Those were just local guys who bought uniforms at the army surplus store. Um, and, you know, that's... That was his position. That's new in history, as far as I know. And it changes the game. 
because then journalists have to decide, do we cover this guy who has this amazing power to create fiction, or do we cover the war? And this then is now the problem of journalists in the United States. Do you cover this guy and his incredible you know, stream of fiction, which is very entertaining and diverting, or do you cover the opioid crisis? Do you cover the actual stories in, in your own country? Um, but the third, the third technique, which is I'm going to just remind you of before I go into the, the happy, optimistic closing note, which was promised for you in the introduction, um, is, is, um, is susceptibilities. So I mentioned fascism. If you were, if you're, if you, if, if, if Facebook thought you were on the political left, then Russia in your Facebook feed in 2014 would place stuff along the lines of Ukraine, the Ukrainians are Nazis and fascists and so on, right? Which led to a lot of very unfortunate writing in the European press and the Guardian, for example, um, where, where actual, actual people in the actual European press wrote on the basis of things which are complete fictions. But, but uh, interestingly, if you were on the extreme right, and I'm just doing this for rhetorical purposes, I don't mean you, um, but if you were on the extreme right and you were on Facebook and Facebook thought you were a racist or an anti-Semite, um, then the Russian stuff in your newsfeed said that Ukraine is a Jewish state, Ukraine's a Jewish construction, the people who run Ukraine are Jewish oligarchs, right? And of course those things contradict. It can't be both Nazi and, and you know, part of the Jewish conspiracy at the same time. But on the internet, no one talks to each other. Contradictions don't matter. And what happens is that the extreme versions then crowd out the middle and make a discussion of what actually happened much harder. The same men in the same building working for the same institution, the Internet Research Agency in Russia, then did the same thing in the American presidential election. This is just one tiny way in which what happened in Ukraine in 2014 was part of what happened to the US in 19, 2016. The same men did the same thing. They said, okay, if you like Hillary Clinton, if you're African American, you like Hillary Clinton, we are gonna fill up your Facebook feed with stuff that says Hillary Clinton is a racist, so you won't vote. If you are a racist, we are going to fill up your Facebook feed with stuff which says Hillary Clinton loves black people. Again, it, do, it contradicts, but that doesn't matter because we're just trying to suppress your votes and we're trying to get you activated so you will vote. And there were consequences to this. So um, that's the third technique. This, and this is a way that the internet facilitates this sort of thing. Okay, here comes the happy part. Um, the part about the future. You, you want, you want there to be a future, right? You, we do want there to be a future? Okay. So I think that this is the real game in politics. I think the division in politics now are not, it's not right left. I think that the main division is true false, which is another way of saying future, no future. Because the truth and the future go together. If you don't believe in the future, there's no reason to care about factuality in the present. Those two thoughts go together. If you want there to be a future, you have to make policy towards the future, and making policy towards the future requires factuality in the present. I think Europe has a wonderful chance, maybe the best chance, to be the, un the political unit which creates some sense of the future. And I'm just gonna articulate very quickly what I think that future might, not what it would look like, but what the argument for it would look like. I think it has to do mainly with humanity. So humanity versus the internet, humanity versus the algorithms. Europe is the only entity in the planet which in a constructive way is trying to deal with the Google and the Facebook. You're the only ones. And that's not just plain defense. That can be seen as an affirmation of humanity. It's not just protection against electoral intervention, which is very important. It's also, the, it's also the positive claim that we're caring about the humans. We're on the side of the humans. Second aspect of the future is climate. Right? You are the political union which cares most about this and has maybe the best chance of solving it. Dealing with climate change is about creating a future in the most basic existential sense. But interestingly, hydrocarbons and futurelessness are very intimately connected. The same, whether it's Russia or America or anywhere else, whether it's Saudi Arabia, the people who are closely connected to hydrocarbon wealth are the same people who suppress the future and who suppress factuality in a very, in a very elemental way. Um, whether it's Sa Saudi Arabia killing a journalist and having his body cup into little pieces, or whether it's Mr. Putin getting dead journalists delivered to him on his birthday, it's the same phenomenon. Hydrocarbons are, are intimately connected to 
the loss of factuality, which leads me to the third thing about the future. The future has to be about the production of factuality, the production of factuality, not just believing in truth, which I think is also very important, but in actively affirming institutions which go out and hunt for the truth. So we have this very complacent, in my view, tradition in Anglo-Saxon philosophy from John Milton through John Stuart Mill um, through Oliver Wendell, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, which says there's a marketplace of ideas in a fair fight, the truth will win. The fact that that argument has won disproves it. That's just not true. It is just not true. It's lazy and it's complacent. If you put five people up on a stage who have five contradictory and crazy views, the truth does not somehow emerge. If you create an institution like the internet in which 99.999% of what's out there is not connected to investigative reporting, put a whole bunch more nines in there, it's very unlikely that that's gonna lead you to the truth. If you allow local news to die and the reporting profession to go away, if nobody's producing the facts to fill up some of the information space, how can the truth possibly have a chance of winning in a debate? It just doesn't happen by itself. There's no automatic mechanism. So I think the places that are going to remain sovereign, or to put it a different way, the places where humane politics are going to be possible are going to be the places which actively engage in the production of facts, which treat factuality as a kind of scarce resource that you, that you, have, to, that you have to try to suppose. The final thing is democracy in time. So democracy, I mean, to put this in a positive way, democracy produces time. You need time for democracy. If nobody believes in the future, nobody will vote. But democracy also produces time. Because when you vote, you're thinking, I might vote two years from now, four years from now, six years from now. Um, so the two, of them, the two of them go together. And then finally, this is the very last thing. What the politics of eternity and the politics of inevitability have in common is that each of them does away with responsibility. So if you think that the future's inevitably going to be like the present but better, that you don't have to do anything about it. You can just kind of go along for the ride. If you think time is just a loop where the others are going to come for us no matter what we do, you don't have to ask what's good. You're good because you're innocent and they're bad because they're attacking you and that's the end of the story. The question of responsibility never arises. That's what the two of them have in common, and that's why it's so easy to go from faith in progress to faith in doom. That's why this shift is so easy, uh, and that's why it's happening. And the only way to get out from under it, I think, is to believe in history as history, right? To say, okay, there is a line of time, but it's not predictable and deterministic. We do have to know things about the past so we can situate ourselves in the present, but once we situate ourselves in the present, then we have to ask the ethical question of what kind of future we want. And this is the final thing I want to say about the future, European or not. We can't get to the future without ethics. We can't get there without facts, but we also can't get there without ethics. What, what inevitability and eternity do is they farm out, they subcontract the question of what's good and evil. We can't do that. If we want to have a future, we have to be concerned about the way the world is, but we also have to be willing to make arguments about what's good. That's where I'm going to stop. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Would you sit here? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for that. That was great. I, I just briefly, <clears throat> because when you say when you said the state cannot make you younger, you may have heard some numbers here. Let me explain you why. There's a <laughs> there's a professional uh, attention seeker slash entertainer right now in the Netherlands who uh, just sued the state of the Netherlands because he's 70 years old and he wants to be recognized being 20 years younger, right. because that's his natural age. Um, okay, got it. <clears throat> I never expected to be talking about Emil Ratelband. Um, <laughs> In this venue, but here it's we are. Connected. You can now forget about him. Thank you, um, <laughs> thank you for this. Um, let, 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 let's, let's talk in a few chapters, uh, chapters, and after a few questions on my behalf, I'll um, give the audience a chance to uh, post questions as well. Okay. Um, to, to start off with your own country, uh, almost matter of factly, you, you s talked about the current American fascism which made me wonder, do you consider um, your president, I guess you're going to say he's not my president, do you consider Donald Trump a fascist? 
the way that I would put it is that he's not even a fascist. So I, I, is that, I would. Is that better? It's it, it's 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 better in some ways, and but, but maybe also worse in some ways. So it's clearly the case. <clears throat> first of all, the United States of America is by no means free from the traditions in history which in Europe are categorized as fascist. The idea that somehow the Atlantic was a barrier in political thought and that we didn't have fascist traditions is completely ridiculous. One can disagree about just who was a fascist in the United States, but we in the 1930s were not that different from you in the 1930s. In fact, America First itself is a reference to a movement in the 1930s, which was headed by a man or was most uh, most famously represented by a man, Charles Lindbergh, who thought that the United States and Nazi Germany should make an alliance against the brown people. So uh, that's what America First was. That's it. Um, so we have those traditions. We can disagree about you know where the lines are, but I just think that's important to, to set out at the beginning, because. In, at least in the United States, we kind of we, we like to start from a position of innocence, which says we're a city on the hill, and of course there are bad things like monarchy and fascism, but those are on they're in some other part of the world. I, I don't accept that at all. I think in the 1930s our politics were very similar to your politics, and that we had a good deal of luck, frankly, that we had good leadership and we had good luck, and we have neither good leadership nor good luck right now. So, the, the so what is fascism then is the second thing. I mean, for me, fascism has has three important parts. Um, the first is that you treat globalization as a face rather than as a series of policy challenges. Um, relatedly, you you reason by way of conspiracy rather than reasoning by way of of individuals and the and the things that they do. Related to that. You, um, you oppose enlightenment and you oppose factuality and you try to put in their place a myth, two myths really, the myth of the organically connected nation and the myth of the connection of the nation with, with the leader. Mr. Trump has indulged in all of those things. I mean, I think the most fascist thing that he does um, is, this, is the fake news move where the Germans and the Austrians, who are fascists now, that is the extreme right in Germany and in Austria now, quite correctly translates fake news as Lügenpresse, which it is. It's exactly the same trope. I mean, Lügenpresse in the mouth of Goebbels or Hitler meant there were a few investigative journalists left in a condition of financial crisis and media centralization, and we're going to hit them as hard as we can by saying that they're the true liars. And that's exactly what Mr. Trump is doing. So, I mean, in historical terms, that's, that's, fascist, that's fascist behavior. I think the incant incantatory chanting, the lock her up, or lately lock him up with reference to George Soros, who by no coincidence is a Jewish financier, and you know the, the whole idea that, that Mr. Soros finances political demonstrations in the United States, which Mr. Trump has said that Mr. Soros might even be financing migrants from the South, which is, by the way, a Hungarian idea, which we have just copied. Those are fascist ideas. I mean, the idea that it's actually, that's actually the central idea of Mein Kampf. The central idea of Mein Kampf is that there's no such thing as liberalism, democracy, rule of law. There's, there's only the race. And if it appears that there's democracy, rule of law, liberalism, somewhere behind it, there's a Jew. That's what Hitler says, right? That is a major, so when you say, oh, we don't really have protesters, we just have a Jewish financier, you are actually doing something fascist. Whether Americans see it or not is a, is a different question. But I say, when I say he's not even a fascist, I think there are a couple of things, there, there, there are several things that are missing. One thing which is missing is a party, right? Fascism was about single party rule. There are many things you can say about the Republican Party. It's, it actually, in some ways, is edging towards single party rule, but it doesn't have an open ideology of single party rule. Another thing which is missing is a youth movement, or more broadly, physical activity. Again, like say what you want about the, mar the fascists, but the fascists could put on a march. Trump supporters can't. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, it's not, it's not a joke. It's an interesting difference, right? Mm -hmm. we, are, we are older and we are in less good physical condition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we don't like to get off the couch. And that's actually, that's, and, and that's a difference because this is... But the march is, is online now. You don't yeah, need a march. That's or... the thing. The politics of us and them takes place largely virtually. Right. So you hate people that you never see. The people who don't like migrants, this is true of Europe too, by the way, are generally people for whom the image of the migrant comes in online rather it's than, than face-to-face. Yeah, well, I think it's, I think it's different. Mm. I think it's different. Um, but I, I, I think physically, like, Trump likes a certain amount of physical violence, but it's interesting that both he and Putin don't like people on the streets whereas fascists really did like people on the streets. And the other thing I mentioned is redistribution. So again, fascists really did want redistribution. They wanted redistribution from 
punished, humiliated Jews and other punished, humiliated national minorities, but they did seriously believe in redistribution. <clears throat> Mr. Trump does not seriously believe in redistribution, and that's and that's that's a difference. So I mean, what I tend to think is that fascism this time around is a little bit like what the Marxists said the last time around, which is that it's a, it's it's a cover for preserving the the present system. In what sense do you consider Mr. Trump perhaps less dangerous because he's an outlier in Washington, uh, meaning that even his own people in his own administration perhaps don't take him seriously? I mean, what, what the, the Republican administration right now is, is doing is pretty standard Republican policy when it comes to economic taxes, etc. They almost seem to, if you read Bob Woodward's book, to contain Trump uh, in a way, is that something that is comforting or am I completely off? Well, I, so, I mean, I, I ended by talking about ethics and responsibility, and I, I believe that very seriously. I think in 2016, Americans, Democratic or Republican, had an obligation to say, we don't want somebody running for the highest office who encourages um, his supporters to carry out acts of violence. We don't want someone running for the highest office who muses publicly about the assassination of his opponent, mm -hmm. which Mr. Trump did twice. Um, and above all, we, we, we should be very careful about a candidacy which seems to be closely connected to a foreign power. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's a very, I, I mean, who knows what historians will think in the future, but I suspect that that moment in 2016, where the Republican leadership said, essentially, we don't care about sovereignty, we just care about winning, I think that was a very important point of self-demoralization, essentially. Because, of course, when the Republican leadership says that, they know it's not true. Mm -hmm. but, their, but their voters don't know it's not true. And so now we've reached a point where the basic facts about the Russian intervention in American politics have become a matter of completely partisan epistemics, where some people think yes, some people think some people think no. So, I, I, I don't find it encouraging fundamentally. I find it I find it demoralizing. I think what Mr. Trump has done is gotten the, the much of the Republican Party into a kind of dance of demoralization, where they rationalize the situation by saying he shall pass, and um, and then they do the things that they want to do anyway, as you say. Um, that is tax cuts for the rich, tax cuts for corporations. But once they do the things they want to do anyway, they are morally brought into the whole situation. They're now morally implicated in the whole thing because you can't just say, well, we're taking advantage of this. It's, it's you, right? It's, it's all one political system. And by the way, I mean, I think that itself is a bad thing. You know, it's interesting how little legislation there was. This is another, I mean, the fundamental, like the activity of Mr. Trump is basically negative, chipping away at trust, chipping away at people's belief in the rule of law, chipping away at the rule of law itself. That's, that's his, his main success is to get Americans not to trust things, not to trust one another. And this is why it's a, a Russian victory, by the way. But they don't pass very many laws. And the laws that they do pass are in tropic. I mean, giving money to rich people is not actually policy. Giving money to rich people is gravity, right? Giving money to rich people is just, that's the way the world works. If you're rich, people give you more money. That's just the way things happen. That doesn't really count as government policy, I don't think, right? And that's, what, that's essentially what they managed to do in two years. No built walls, no infrastructure projects, you know, no alternative health care plan, nothing. Just a couple of laws, tax cuts for the rich, tax cuts for corporations which itself I think is a bad thing. Um, I mean, not only do we have the biggest deficit imaginable, um, but we also have a situation where it's gonna be much harder for the state to do the things it needs to do in the future to promote equality. Before the inauguration, I think at the, by the end of 2016, you published On Tyranny, which was a brief, well, can I call it a, a pamphlet or, yeah, sure. you know, about um, the, the steps towards tyranny. And, and I said, we, we spoke. Um, in your office that was 100 days into the Trump administration. Back then you were saying he's, he's checking all the boxes so far. Is there, any, um, is there any light, any box he has not checked yet? Uh, would you agree with me that, that even though they've been shaken, the, the pillars of democracy have proven themselves to be intact? Mm. I think it's more like we're like we're you know like we're archaeologists and we're digging in the desert and we think we know where these pillars of democracy are mm -hmm. and they turn out not to be there at all mm -hmm. but there are maybe a couple of other pillars or at least rocks mm -hmm. and we look at these rocks and we say you know with a little bit of imagination this could be a pillar that could be a pillar <laughs> 
I think it's more like that. Like there definitely are some rocks, mm -hmm. but it's not clear that they're pillars and they're definitely not where they're supposed to be. But the checks and balances work. There's, there's now a Democratic Congress, half the, the, the but, House. But that's not, that's not, so, sorry to interrupt, but that's, no, no, please. that's not the way that checks and balances are supposed to work. Checks and balances are supposed to be that at the federal level, the legislature, that is the Congress, and the courts are supposed to check the executive, right. regardless of which party is in power. Right. And that didn't happen. No. So the fact that you that you have to say the Democrats have to hold a chamber for there to be a check actually indicates the failure of, right. of checks and balances. Where where I mean where we have found these things that are like pillars, are in unexpected places. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the, the American, as we were talking about before, the American elite is actually brought in deep. Um, I mean, it's one of the sad, or one of the tragic things about the United States right now is we really, I mean, we really do have a broad and deep and interesting elite. It's just, it's just that at the moment we're doing negative selection. That is the, the people who are least qualified are the ones who are rising to the top. Um, I, I could give a number of examples, but there's a broad and deep American elite which fills certain institutions, and it's, it's not that easy to control those institutions. And those institutions are often institutions of power, which you would need of brute power, of armed power, which you would need if you were truly going to form an authoritarian government. And the second place where you know, we, there have been some, there's been some resistance, um, which, we, which is important, is journalism. I mean, it's just, if the Trump administration happened five years later, I think we'd be in a very, very difficult position because it happened at a time when we still like now. Yeah. I mean, it, because it, it, in 2016, there were still a few journalists. Right. And now there are more. Mm -hmm. But what if it had happened at a time when journalism was dead as a profession? Then we wouldn't know anything. Mm -hmm. Then the Mueller investigation wouldn't be possible. Mm -hmm. um, then we wouldn't, you know, then, then there would be very few checks on him. I mean, there's a reason why he says journalists are the enemy of the people. His political instincts are right. If it's not for the journalists, then, you know, then, then a major check would be, would be gone. But the other place which Europeans sometimes overlook is the states. So America is a federal system, right. and <clears throat> both progressively and regressively, it's often the states which set the examples. So progressively, gay marriage is possible in the U.S. because it started in certain states. Regressively, uh, voter suppression is an experiment which is carried out in certain states. Uh, it's it's it, it's a good sign that voter suppression didn't always work this time around um, because when when voter suppression works then people start thinking well it really doesn't matter whether I vote or not mm -hmm. this system really is a joke mm -hmm. um, well I want to get to journalism at, at, at the end and and how, how the media should deal with um, people like Trump because it is a struggle, obviously. But, but one more question, and then uh, I'd like to go to the first round of audience questions. W one more question about um, <clears throat> the, the more we talk about Russian interference in, in the American system, the, the less we seem to talk about another reason for Mr. Trump winning. Um, many American voters being disgusted with generations of neoliberal politicians, you know, the Clintons, Obama in a way, et cetera, et cetera. Isn't, isn't that a risk that by focusing, keep focusing on Russia, uh, that um, we forget to focus on, on things that Russia has no part in? Yeah, I mean, I think part of, Part of living in a factual world is recognizing that several things can happen at the same right, time. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, this book is about, and, but and, still. No, but and that sometimes they're related in interesting ways. So I think, I, I mean, in one way I agree with you. I think it's very important not to blame everything on Russia because mm -hmm. there's no way Russia could have done what they did if it hadn't been for what I was calling our politics of inevitability. Like if we weren't so unbelievably complacent about the way social platforms work on the internet, then we might have noticed <laughs> a little bit earlier um, that major websites that people were quoting, I mean, including Mr. Trump himself, were Russian operations. But that didn't occur to anybody in time because we were basically because we were very naive about it. Um, and then the other thing you mentioned, you know, what you're calling neoliberalism, which I would you know, characterize as inequality, mm -hmm. that's that enables Mr. Trump. You're absolutely right. Um, but it, but it, but it, it fits into this larger argument because Russia shows how oligarchy works. Right. Russia picks out Mr. Trump as their pet <laughs> oligarch, right? Or he's actually a wannabe oligarch. He's not actually an oligarch because he doesn't have any money. Um, but <laughs> and if he does, just prove it, right? I challenge anybody to prove that the man actually has any money um, because if he does, you know, we know he has debt, um, and we know his father gave him three, the equivalent of three hundred and forty million dollars, which like. 
if I pick any of you right. in the audience and give you $340 million, you will then be $340 million richer than Mr. Trump. Which, um, if, I, if, I may, <laughs> if I may interrupt you, so this is a big New York Times story investigation of the summer, the one you're referring to, yeah. huge investigation into his finances. Mm. One day later, everybody forgot about it. Yeah. Nobody cared. Well, I care. Except you. I, mean, I know. You care. Some of you care. It's my job. Yeah, right? but it didn't. You At know what I mean? At least like you're still thinking about what you do with the $340 million <laughs> and how you could make more out of it than Mr. Trump did, yeah. um, which is six bankruptcies and $800 million in debt. You can all do better than that. That's my American <laughs> dream for you. If I give you $340 million, you can do better than six bankruptcies and $800 million in debt. Um, I've accepted but, but, you know, but the, yeah. the, the charming thing about the New York Times report is that they know that. Like, they knew that they were writing this for the future, right? right? Like, they knew that this was part of some future court filing, mm -hmm. that this was part of some future mm -hmm. history book. But, but they what does it mean that they, it didn't? They, they did it anyway. Well, what it means is that, um, that journalism is a precious thing, which is challenged on all fronts. Because, of course, a much worse world than one where everybody <clears> changes <throat> the subject the next day is one where the story is never published. I know, all. but the fact that nobody basically cared. I don't know. I think I think you're overdoing it. I mean, some yeah. people it has that did make a certain difference in in the conversation. Okay. And the Mueller team certainly cared, and and the state of New York cared. I mean, look, we're in a very weird situation in the U.S. Trump has to be president because he knows he's violated laws. <laughs> he, and he knows that we know these violated laws, and some of those laws are state laws. In other words, he, even if you believe he can pardon himself. Which is, Which is a like mind-blowingly unethical. Like it's like loaning it's like loaning money to yourself, right? Hey, I'm going to loan myself three hundred and forty million dollars. Um, but but even if you believe that Mr. Trump can pardon himself, he actually lacks the he lacks the statutory power to pardon himself for state crimes, and he's clearly committed state crimes. So he has to be president. You see, he has to be president until he dies. Look look at it from the poor man's point of view. I wish he was here. Um, I don't know where Tim is, who's the most yeah, important guy in the room, because he has the microphone. So if there are any questions, hopefully a bit about the U.S. first. Yeah. He's not an intern. He's a very well-paid young man. <laughs> Two questions, uh, I, yeah. very briefly. Uh, the first one, it seems that you, uh, you like to blame Russia for, for the elections, etc. Uh, at the same time, America is uh, notorious for fixing uh, elections and maybe changing even governments in uh, different countries. So uh, I wonder how you look at that. I, I think America started, Russia is just, you know, learning. <laughs> um, and the question is, is there, any sorry. Um, is there any scenario in which Trump is going to be impeached? Yeah. Okay. So Let's start with the first. That's a yeah. good question. So there's a, there's, a ve I mean, there's a very important ethical point to make before I answer your question historically. And the ethical point is, do we think that intervening in other people's elections is bad? I take it you think that it's bad. I'm looking for a nod here or a head shake. You don't care. OK, so it, do we think that on principle inter intervening in elections is bad? That seems to me to be the live ethical question. Because if we think it's bad, then we think it's bad. So I think it's a bad thing for the United States to intervene in Italian elections or Latin American elections. I think it's bad because I think that I believe in both sovereignty and democracy. I don't think the United States ought to be in that business. By the same principle, I don't think Russia should intervene in the American elections. It's not about liking to blame Russia. It's about a principle. I mean, it, it's the same. I mean, I find and, and this is a very simple thing, I think, but it's, it's somehow very hard in practice. Like take war as another example. How many people were both against the American invasion of Iraq and against the Russian invasion of Ukraine? I was against both on the same kind of logic. I don't think countries should be invading other countries on the basis of total lies. It's a sort of simple principle, and it seems to rule out both the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the American invasion of Iraq. I'm against aggressive illegal wars uh, fought on the basis of complete lies. If, you're, if you accept principles, then you have to be critical of everyone, whether it's Russia or America. Right? So it's not that I like to blame Russia. I'd like for Russia to be completely blameless. It would be a better world. But in this particular case, 
there is a, now moving to the historical part, there is a huge amount of evidence um, that Russia did intervene in the American elections. And we can't not chronicle what actually happened. Um, we have to chronicle what, what actually happened. On impeachment, before yeah. we go to one yeah. more thing on this, because that was actually one question that I wanted to ask as well, because even though what you're saying, what you're saying is true, people like the late John McCain, who has never found a country that, that he didn't want to invade, was so much so big on this Russia intervention. I mean, there was some hypocrisy there, right? And, and there still is. But that's, I mean, that, this is the thing. If we can't make ethical arguments mm -hmm. because people aren't perfect, mm -hmm. we can't make ethical arguments. I mean, but not being perfect is the complete up. That's, that's the complete one end. But no, it, well, if we can't make political arguments, if you can't be right because someone agrees with you okay. for bad reasons, you can't be right. right. I mean, either we believe that there are ethical arguments to be made or we don't. I mean, either we're in a world where we say, I am, for example, I'm against illegal wars of aggression fought on the basis of total lies, or we're in a world which says, yeah, well, some of the people who, who didn't, you know, some of the people who opposed the invasion of Iraq had, didn't brush their teeth in the morning or whatever. I mean, e e e e either we're in this world or we're in that world. I don't care what John McCain thought about other things. He was either right or wrong. I mean, this is where I end, right? You, have to, you either believe in you know, right and wrong or you don't believe in right and wrong. Um, and you know, there, I think if, if you want to outline principles, you have to outline principles and then you can't say, well, this principle doesn't count because somebody else is a, is a hypocrite. I mean, if we do that, then there, there will be no principle left standing because somebody, is, somebody who agrees with you about this thing is always going to be wrong for some other reason. So, right. you know, I think Europe should have an army. President Putin thinks that Europe should have an army. Does that mean that Europe should, Europe have, should an not army, have an army? Right. I mean, right. you know. Fair point. Okay. Yeah. So, what, was there some well, other we're going to talk about impeachment. Uh, oh, let's impeachment, go about yeah. impeachment. Yeah, that question. Yeah, I mean, so just to be, I mean, like, it's, it's going to be unclear what impeachment actually means. Impeachment is an accusation. So it's not a trial. It, in, the, in, the, in the American system, the House of Representatives impeaches by a simple majority, which then triggers a trial in the Senate, where the Senate can only convict by a two-thirds majority, which ain't going to happen. So it's possible that he'll be impeached, but impeachment is not a route to his leaving office. Unless it's also, Mueller comes up with something astonishing. Even, well, I would say even, yeah, it'd have to be pretty astonishing. And the Republicans have a, have a It'd have to be pretty astonishing because right. the things, I mean, honestly, the things that we already know are pretty astonishing, mm -hmm. like that his, you know, his campaign manager has been convicted of multiple counts of conspiracy against the United States. Like these are already things which in mm -hmm. the previous world would have been totally unthinkable. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mr. Mr. Clinton was impeached for lying about sexual relations, which mm -hmm. I mean, lying is bad and I'm against it. But, compa you know, compared to asking a foreign power, like Mr. Trump stood up and said, Russia, if you're out there, <clears throat> please try to get Hillary Clinton's emails. And that same day, Russian military intelligence began a spear phishing attack, which included Mrs. Clinton and people who knew right. her trying to get her emails. Yeah. If a Democrat had done that, right, we th certainly Republicans would be calling for impeachment. So I'm not quite, I no longer believe that there is anything. I mean, I think that we could have video of Mr. Tr well, I'm going to stop my fantasy right stop there. there. Stop right but there. I, but, I, but I do think that there is, I, I, I don't think that, I think the Mueller, I think the Mueller thing will be very significant, but I don't think it alone is a route to impeachment, unless, as you say, there's something truly outrageous. But I think it's much more likely that Mr. Trump's reaction to the Mueller report is what's going to do him in. Right. Uh, in what sense? <laughs> uh, well, I don't, I feel like I shouldn't give away their strategy. <laughs> There's no live feed tonight. In what sense? <laughs> there, there is, right? There is, there is in fact, okay, live feed there is. tonight. Okay, yeah. okay. I didn't know you knew. Um, you Figure had a question. <laughs> Thank you very much for your wonderful speech, by Thank the way. You. Um, you mentioned Europe. Should I stand up? Yes. yes. Okay. okay. Uh, you mentioned Europe. You mentioned Ukraine. Uh, when Russia invaded, uh, uh, first took Crimea, the little green man, and after that Donbass, uh, uh, I think Putin was handed the most beautiful gift. Europe said, war is not an option, which is in line with what you said about Western Europe being convinced that war is such a ter terrible thing, it should be unthinkable. 
But now we have the situation of Crimea still in Russian hands and a, a, a war that continues in Donbass. Mm -hmm. What is wise for Europe? Mm -hmm. So there's, 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 there's an interesting deep point um, which I would <coughs> develop from that premise which has to do with the nature of war. And it, it's a point which Russian military doctrine actually has advanced in um, open documents, namely that war is not about combat. Combat is a means to the end. And this is, a, this is by the way, a very traditional position. This is what Clausewitz says. Combat is a means to an end. War is about breaking the will of the enemy. And the interesting thing about the campaign in Ukraine is that although, as you say, Russia used military force in a quite straightforward way in Crimea um, and in the Donbass, the, that was, I think, a minor part of the overall campaign. The ratio of actual traditional military activity <clears throat> to what we used to call propaganda, but I think is more pro properly called cyber war, that ratio was incredibly low, right? I mean, for every dead Russian soldier, there was an immense number of gigab gigabytes of fake news, distraction, invented stories, or to put it a different way, the number of people who were engaged to create communication about the war was probably significantly greater than the number of soldiers who were actually fighting in the war, which I think is probably something new in history. And it's, 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 it's interestingly relevant because, and this is something that I, that I said back at the time, and I wrote this in early 2014, that what's happening is that Russians are losing the war on the ground, which they didn't expect, but they're winning the war in the ether which they also didn't expect, and that that was the constructive lesson. And that's the thing I was trying to say at the end about how we were vulnerable with our politics of inevitability, because what the Russians learned in 2014 was that they could really fool us about basic things using certain kinds of tactics, which they then applied in the Netherlands, as you all know, about around MH17 and around the referendum, and then the United States in 2016. They learned, that where, the, they, learned where they could actually break our will which was less on the battlefield and more over the internet. And that's, you know, that's, that's why I classify the 2016 US presidential campaign as a cyber war, which we lost. And if you only, like, you know, you only, it's good to lose wars sometimes. I mean, we lose them a lot, but you only, the weakness of Americans is they don't recognize when they've lost a war, right? Like that's, you, you have to learn, you have to recognize that you've lost a war to learn from it. And that's, that's kind of our weak spot. Because we've lost a bunch, but we have, a, we have trouble remembering them. Um, or we remember them as like victimhood. Uh, but anyway, my point is that we lost a cyber war in 2016, and then we, we were failing, we we're very actively failing to draw the lessons from that, partly because of the nature of, of the outcome, you know, which is that losing a cyber war means that a certain person becomes president of the United States. But yeah, I mean, I, 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 agree, with, I agree with your premise. When, when, when you say war is unthinkable, then, you don't, then if it's unthinkable, it can't be happening. <laughs> It, it can't be happening, and you can't be noticing the reaction. Now, what, what should Europe be doing about this? I, I don't think, I mean, as I said, I've, I've actually thought for a very long time that there should be a European army. Um, and uh, you know, this is one of the many ways in which I don't represent the official American position. If that hasn't been clear to you up to now, <laughs> let me just now issue this qualification. Um, but I, but I think I think it, I think it's very sensible to have a European army. I think it's very sensible for there to be European cyber defense. I think more important than cyber defense, though, is is what I mentioned at the end: the developing factuality, like actually cultivating factuality. Because the only way to defend yourself against the myths that foreigners send into your system is to have a network of fact of fact producing, of fact production. But with respect to Ukraine in particular, the way that Europe wins is that the unoccupied parts of Ukraine work. And that is a big challenge. That's a big, that's like a half century challenge, which by the way, is how long it took to unite Germany. It's that kind of event, I think. You know, I don't, I don't see the Ukrainian army triumphantly storming into, you know, Luhansk anytime soon. But I certainly can't imagine a West German, East German type scenario where one part of a country ends up looking so much better than the other part of a country. Um, that the, the that the outcome then becomes more or less foreordained, and that's not just for you. I mean, that's my advice to Ukrainians. But it's also like the war is not an excuse not to reform. The war is the reason why you do reform. But but it's it's also I think advice for Europe that that this part the part the unoccupied part of Ukraine has to succeed, and that's I think your best. I think that's the most sensible Russian policy 
as well. It's very hard to influence Russia directly, but it is possible to do something for smaller states to show that the rule of law is actually not a joke. Not easy, but I think it's possible. Just briefly about the, the misinformation campaign, you talked about that. You coined the phrase uh, implausible deniability in your, in your book. What do you mean by that? Well, by implausible deniability, I mean you deny facts that everyone knows are true, and then you dare people to call you on it. So in the invasion of Ukraine, um, the, 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 the chief example of implausible deniability was the denial of the invasion itself. I mean, of course, there have been many cases of black <coughs> operations and covert operations, but to actually invade a country mm -hmm. and then stand up and say, we're not invading a country, those are guys who bought camouflage uniforms at an army surplus store, that's actually new. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a form of audacity which I don't think had been seen in the history well, I want to say in the history of lying, but history of lying is big and broad. But in the history of warfare, that's a pretty big lie. And it served a purpose because implausible deniability is, is a trap because it's, 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 it's catnip for journalists. It's honey for journalists because then the journalists say, oh, we're going to focus on this person and trying to prove that what he's saying isn't true. And of course it's not true. But when you accept those rules of the game, what you've done is become a participant in a reality television show, um, which is what happened in fact. So everybody, I mean, and I remember this with intense, I, I mean, this was intensely painful for me at the time. I was trying to get journalists, German journalists, other journalists to cover the war or to cover what were the obvious preparations for war, right? I mean, I actually, I, I, went, I went on the record and predicted that Russia would, in, pr would, Russia would invade <coughs> Ukraine. Um, partly on the basis of troop movements. But, but um, at the time, all the journalists wanted to talk about was Putin's mind. Like, what's in Putin's mind? Is he, will he go in or won't he? Like, it's all about him. And that's a problem, because once, once the story becomes all about <clears throat> him, then it's not about Ukraine. Right. Ukraine disappears. It's not, about the, it's not about the agency of Ukrainians. It's not about what the Ukrainians are trying to do. It's not about the war that they're going to suffer. It's not about the shells that are going to fall on their towns. It's about this man and his ability to defy or define reality. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I mean by implausible deniability. But it's also a big, um, it's a big dilemma because uh, obviously when we go back to Trump, he keeps throwing little shiny objects to the media, but... <laughs> You know, this president lies, the fact check of the Washington Post has, you know, is, is keeping track of this. He lies 30 times a day during the midterms campaign. It, it's always the task of journalists, you know, whenever a president is either attacking the rule of law or other basics of, of the um, um, basic stuff in politics, ethical stuff, but particularly politicians not telling the truth. Um, you have to point that out or not. So what's the alternative for not going after all those lies, except for also doing deeper investigative stuff? Yeah, no, that, I mean, it's very simple, but that's, I think that's the answer. I agree with you. When politicians lie, journalists have to correct them. Every and time. It's like, yeah, every time. And, it's, and that, that, is very dis that is very distracting work because this president not only lies, he lies orders of magnitude more than other people. He lies like, he, lie. like other pe people breathe. Yeah. Almost. Yeah, I mean, well, like, you know, like Buddhists with really regular, I think, breath powder. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but, but, but yes, journalists have to do that, but I think they have to not see that as their main task. I think right. like that, that, you have to play defense, but the best defense is a good offense. And the way journalists play offense is just by reporting stuff. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the big stories are the, the big story in the world is a story of inequality. The big story in the world is a story of where the oligarchs hide their money. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a story of which Mr. Trump is an active part. And it matters a great deal. I mean, even if one story doesn't seem to change the world, it matters a great deal that reporters are actually reporting on those mm -hmm. stories. Do you feel in general, the American press is doing a decent job? Oh, I see it's quantity rather than quality, right? I mean, we, there's so many stories to be reported on and there aren't enough journalists to report on them. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. We just, right. there are only a couple thousand actual investigative journalists in a country of more than 300 million people. And that's just not enough. Mm -hmm. there, this is why I keep stressing the local news. You have to have local institutions that create factuality on a local basis by way of investigation. And it seems very simple, but 
it just it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So the Post and the Guardian and the Times and also other 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 news agencies, including BuzzFeed, has done a good job on some things. Um, they have done reporting. And that reporting has made a difference. But what I think is, okay, if you take away those five institutions, we would be completely lost. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather imagine a world where instead of five or six or seven or eight, there were 60 mm -hmm. or 70 or 80 institutions that were capable of doing serious investigations. Mm -hmm. I, think, I, think that's, I think that's the answer. I think Mr. Trump is aware that it's the answer. And this is why you, you dedicate your book to... Uh, reporters, in a sense. I literally, I mean, when I say, I dedicate to reporters the heroes of our time because I believe that reporters are the heroes of our time in the sense that they are taking risks for things that are real. Mm -hmm. And also in the sense that without them, we would we would literally be helpless, right? Mm -hmm. Without the reporters, we would, we would not be able to get our minds around inequality and war, which are the big stories of, of our time. So, and, and, and also in a philosophical sense, I mean, like, you know, a doctor can't tell you exactly what health is, and a reporter can't tell you exactly what truth is, but reporters are professionally dedicated to pursuing health, truth, just mm -hmm. as doctors are professionally dedicated to pursuing health, and that is invigorating for all of the rest of us. Mm -hmm. We, all of the rest of us need that. No, we don't just need the particular facts, we need the pursuit of the ethic mm -hmm. of, of factuality, so. Was it different for you while writing this book as a, uh, as a historian to to write about the now, um, uh, d d different from previous books, because you're writing this as a, you know, as a as a, as a journalist in a way uh, as well. Journalists write about the present. So, it was it was harder, but not for the reasons I would expect. Um, I mean, I guess one thing I would say <coughs> is that the road to freedom is a history book. It's not mm. anything else. It's a history book. The, sure. the weird thing about it is it is about the present. But the very the <laughs> traditional conservative things about it are that it's mostly on the basis of primary sources. I, I, I lean very heavily on the, the languages that I can use. So it, in the beginning of the book, it's mostly Russian sources and Ukrainian sources. And then we get to the German and the French and the Polish stuff and then English at the end when I'm talking about the United States. Um, it's also a very traditional history book in that it develops an argument over time. I mean, it's meant to be an argument for itself. So the thing that I'm saying is the answer to inevitability and eternity is history and responsibility. So by writing a history book about the present, I'm trying to show that we can actually understand the present. We don't have to fall into these narratives and that history is one way of doing so. I, I'm sure that there are others. The thing that was hardest about it is that video is awful. That's the hardest thing about it. So, the, the printing What's press. What's so awful about video? I work for television. The, 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 so. Oh, yeah, tied to the internet audience. Um, the, oh. uh, the, the, the thing, the reason why video is awful is that it's unbelievable. The ratio of how much of how many computer bytes you need to confer actual information in the human sense is unbelievably awful. Right. So, like a video which let's say it takes, you know, whatever, let's say this video takes um, one gigabyte and it takes you three hours to watch. And at the end, you've learned as much as you could have learned by reading a transcript of that video in two minutes, right? Or a newspaper article about it in one minute. That's, that, that's the, all. if you're a historian, I mean, the thing that you can do, your superpower as a historian is that you're literate. And so you can go back and you can read documents very quickly um, you can take t you can take 10,000 documents. This is you know more or less typical example. You take 10,000 documents and you have a couple of weeks and you can sort through them and figure them out. Read the most important ones with care, collate them, compare them, and come up with some version of events, which is plausible. With video, that's unbelievably difficult. That's actually the hardest thing about writing about the present is that so many things that happened like around MH17. There's in, the, in Road to Unfreedom, there is a careful four or five paragraph discussion of the various Russian fictions around MH17. To write those five paragraphs, I had to expose myself to hundreds of hours of, of Russian television. Um, and it's not just that that was bad for my mental health, it, it also just took hundreds of hours that I could have usefully spent doing other things. So th the hard thing about the present is that. And, and, it's, and when people are writing about, and, 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 and interestingly, 50 years from now, it's going to be worse because a lot of the video is simply not going to exist anymore, right? Yeah. I did not expect this answer. Um. Well. <laughs> now I know. Good. Um, questions over here, yeah. Hello, good evening. Thank you for coming along. Very interesting talk. I 
<clears throat> puts me in mind of something I'd just like to check with you. Um, freedom, the, uh, the unfreedomizing of democracy. Um, I think the Germans and the Russians and uh, all the other aspects you've mentioned are a little bit of a smokescreen because what I'm hearing basically is a problem, a crisis with democracy itself. And Socrates spoke about this. Five stages of government, autocracy, uh, aristocracy, eventually tyranny. And in democracy, democracy will itself devour itself. Where there's too much freedom, when the people elected are not really up to the job, and you mentioned in America a big layer of people who are just getting up there, but they're not quite the, the, the real deal. And the voters who are not thinking, are not uh, invested with the truth, and uh, don't have the time span for it, like so much so. What's your, what's your my, question? My point yeah. is, actually, the problem with unfreedom coming our way is uh, current democracy dissolving itself, whereby a tyranny, a tyrant, and, and there, I won't say in the fascist because Stalin was a tyrant, Mao was a tyrant, but a tyrant arises when people are uninformed, they vote out of, they vote out of gut and alliance, and then the tyrant, once he's in, he's doing what back, Trump's doing now, backsliding. Fire Comey, fire what's your, what's your question? I'd like to get is, to your Is the fundamental problem here not a, 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 a quintessentially a problem with our modern democracy, and not with the fact that the Russians are, okay. are, are making it a bit awkward too? No, the problem is the fundamental democracy. Okay. Has Thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, I would, I would cast that a slightly different way, and it, it goes back to ethics, which has come up in a number of different connections. Yeah. You, 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 do we think democracy is a good thing or not? That, that seems to me to be an important question. Do we, do we, no, I'm not asking you, this is yeah. part of my answer. Don't ask um, him questions, don't, the, ask, uh, don't ask the, him questions. Yeah, uh, the, the, this, this Socrates and the questions, they're not actually meant to be answered. Um, <laughs> so the, <laughs> so the, um, the uh, where was I? So the, 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 I think you, we can't do without the ethical part of whether we think democracy is good or not. And the reason we can't do without it is the, is the point which you quite correctly make, namely that democracy doesn't defend itself. So when you say that like, it's a problem of democracy that it gives rise to tyranny, well, I mean, it's a problem of tyranny that gives rise to tyranny too. You know, the, 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 there is no automatic defense against tyranny. There's no, like, there's no magic bullet. There's no word that has a C at the end of it. There's no ism which automatically defends us from tyranny. There's just no such thing, and that's kind of my point. Um, there is no, oh, do you have one? Okay, well, I, I am interested. The, there is no, there's no set of human beliefs or values or institutions which is incorruptible, right? That's the nature of us. That's the nature of, of history. So we have to start from the question, do we actually want democracy? And, you know, I think some of us do. Why? Like, why is it? Why is it good? And then, what would you actually do to keep democracy going? Because again, I agree with you, and I agree with what you say about the Greeks. Of course, democracy doesn't automatically defend itself over time. Of course, it's subject to challenges. And um, you know, Aristotle did say what you say, namely that the problem with democracy is. Uh, well, you put Aristotle and Plato together here. The problem with democracy is that democracy tends towards oligarchy because the oligarchs will always spread fiction among the masses, which, you know, admittedly is not a completely inaccurate description of what's going on in the present world. But it doesn't mean that all the details are irrelevant. It doesn't mean that how Russia works it is irrelevant. It doesn't mean that how Facebook works is irrelevant. It doesn't mean that the details of our present pr political predicament are irrelevant because we have to understand those details if we want to make democracy better able to defend itself. And that's why I think the details are important. Other questions? Um, I, yeah, over there. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to move it back to Russia, if you don't, uh, don't mind, uh, connecting your notion of inevitability with futurelessness. I mean, many people would argue that uh, Russia today has indeed no, no future. Uh, at the same time, over the past a little over 100 years, uh, Russians have maybe surprised the world by having two revolutions, uh, more or less. So what is your assessment of the capacity for change of the Russian population? Thank you. Yeah, so I, mean, I, know, I know that you got this, but I'm just going to clarify my position before I answer your question. When I was talking about the futurelessness of Russia, 
or America or any other place, I don't literally mean that there's no future, right? I don't literally mean that time is going to stop. What I mean is that we're in this interesting moment in historical time where discussing the future seems to be very difficult and where proposing futures seems to have become very difficult. And I think, in, as in many other things, Russia has been at the forefront of, of this particular development. It's like a lot of other things, it came to Russia first and then it's arriving in, in other places in the West afterwards. But of course, I do think that Russia as a country has a future. And I think that Russia as a society has a future. And I think that future is highly unpredictable. Now, when you speak of, when you speak of revolution, um, I, 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 I'm not sure what the second, do you mean 1905 and 1917? Or did you mean like, in 89? That, okay, I mean, there wasn't, there were revolutions in the communist world in 1989. I don't, I don't think one can characterize what happened in August of 91 in Russia as, as a revolution. It was a, it was a failed, it was a failed coup. But I, I mean, I, I agree with the premise of your question, which is that something unpredictable will happen in Russia. The nature of the current Russian system is that probably bad, unpredictable things will happen before any good, unpredictable things can happen. Um, because what the, what the current Russian system is very bad at doing is preparing any kind of, let's say, not so bad future. Um, it's very bad at admitting that there's a succession problem. It's very bad at training up with who the successors might be. And it's even worse at creating the institutions which would naturally allow people to become those successors. So that means that we're likely to have bad surprises before they're good surprises. But do I think that Russia can renew itself? Of course I think that. Of course I think that. I think that, I mean, uh, I, I think so. In the 20th century analysts of Russia, the ones that I'm most sympathetic to are always the ones who say Russia is full of possibility. And they're always the ones who say there are multiple traditions in Russia. They're always the ones who point out that the Russian intelligentsia has includes big swaths of opinion which haven't yet come to power, which remains true. Um, and they're always the ones who say that Russia is not somehow separated from European history, but it's part of European history. I believe all of those things too. I don't think that where Russia is now is a dead end. I do think though that there's a, there's a, there's a and, I, and I tried to make this connection earlier, it's, it's very hard for Russia or Saudi Arabia or anyone else to get out of this kind of political system so long as there are such easy rents to be made from hydrocarbons. That is, that is, a, that is a structural problem which affects you regardless of whether you're Russia or Saudi Arabia. And I say that because you know, Europeans don't often make this connection, but insofar as you're in favor of Nord Stream, like insofar as you're in favor of a long-term European dependence on Russian hydrocarbons, you're also in favor of tyranny in Russia. Because Russia's not gonna get another, Russia's not gonna get another form of government without another form of economy. And Russia's not gonna get another form of economy until Europe weans itself away from hydrocarbons. So there's a deep connection here um, between hydrocarbons and the form of politics. There's also a deep connection between European policy choices and the, and the system that we currently have in Russia. But yes, in the medium and long term, I certainly believe that other kinds of Russias are, are possible, absolutely. So you're siding with Trump on the Nord Stream issue? Yeah, I'm also, I mean, I disagree with, I disagree with Mr. Trump about many things, and I disagree with but the current Polish government about many things, mm -hmm. but on, on this particular issue, I think they're both right. Good. We have room for one more question. Well, y you pick. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your talk. I have a question about the future. You said something about uh, Europe. <laughs> The focus we have here on the First World War and the Second World War, somehow these are also the limits, how we consider ourselves, and that we are very much looking to the past framed in the nation state. Mm -hmm. And you said actually that the future is somehow in the colonial past, the, imp the empire we have. So I would be very interested in which way would we need to link oh. back to our imperial past to form okay. a different way how uh, Europe looks into the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is such a wonderful question. Um, because 
the, the, so, so I'm a historian. I'm, I, 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 I believe in historical time, and I believe in the pursuit, the pursuit of historical truth. We, we never get there, just like journalists can never quite get there. But I believe, I really believe that historians can make can make the past make more sense, and thereby make the present make more sense. And this, the, 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 the way that Europeans process the past, I think, is a very good example of this. There are architects and artists of memory who have constructed these separate parallel European national pasts, which are taught to children and which are commemorated, and which, when they're not false, they're so incomplete as not really to make very much sense. And the way that the European Union is, is, is set up is actually designed to confirm that, right? In, in matters of national culture, the European Union as it's currently set up, basically it, it, it accepts the national past as a kind of national responsibility. And so there's this paradoxical consequence of European integration, which is that the way that you teach history is even more nationalist than the way we teach history because it involves it involves a couple of dozen different nationalisms, and ours only involves arguably one, maybe two. We'll see. Um, so, and and w what I think is that history is the answer to that, because what history shows, and I'm by, I'm by no means the only person to argue this. I mean, there are plenty of specialists on Europe, um, you know, from uh, who 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 makes some version of this argument. Tony Jutt's post-war makes a version of this argument. Um, Harold, Harold James makes a version of this argument. Mark Mazower makes a version of this argument. That the, the, the real story in European history is empire integration, which means that your real past is the imperial past, which means that the way to think about Europe is how it is and isn't an answer to empire. So for European, so the interesting thing about the European Union is that more powerful states recognize less powerful states as equals. That's the interesting thing in the history of the world. Um, another way of putting that is that former imperial powers who had gone around the world not recognizing other polities as real recognized European polities as real. Or another way of looking at it is that the major European power, Germany, which had just fought a world war, the Second World War, on the logic that some of its neighbors, Poland and the Soviet Union in particular, were not actually states, that they were, they were, they were zones inhabited by colonial peoples, that that same state then made the move to acknowledging other states as being, as being equal. That's the interesting thing. And so the, I think the way to think about the European achievement is to think about it as, as precisely post-imperial, like as a way of getting Europeans out of empire. Once you think about it that way, then the next question becomes, what does the European Union then do, or how can, what does the European Union then do for other places which are post-imperial, which are either North African or which are East European? Um, because the, 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 incre the, the incredibly sad, self-satisfied thing about the European achievement is that it's a withdrawal back to Europe. Right, like we we went out and you know we went to Indonesia or you know we went to North Africa, whatever it might be, um, India, but now we're going to basically block that out of the way we think about the past, and we're going to focus on this false story about how we learned lessons from the Second World War. Um, that you know that that's the the weakness, that's the self satisfied part, that's the politics of inevitability part, where you say we're smart nations, we've you know we learned from the past. I think. A European history, which was actually taught to school children, which began from empire, and which related the loss, the defeats in imperial wars to European integration, would show both what Europe has achieved, but also what, your, what the moral obligations of Europe are with respect to the world, which you know, I can't answer definitively, but I think that, would be, that kind of reframing of the issue would be, would be very constructive. But the, the fundamental thing I would say is that, and this is why I like the question so much, Europe has, it's not just that Europe has to have a future, Europe has to be the future. <laughs> Europe has to be the future, because if it isn't the future, it's not. It's not going to be. If, if, the, if politics is about the past, Europe is going to lose. Right? It's going to lose to the nations. It's already declared the past belongs to the nations. Euro, if Europe's going to be, it has to be about the future. And the only, and, and, and this is going to sound like a very provincial historian talking, but I'm deeply convinced of this. You can't have future time without past time. You can't have a future without history. You can't think your way into a future without having some more or less true version of the past. 
And so part of getting to a Europe, part of thinking sensibly about a European future, I think involves getting the past of Europe right. And so I think that would, that itself would be a step in, in the right direction. It's not about saying, you know, it's not about making the move to, we thought we were great, but now we realize everything is our fault because everything is our fault is also a form of inaction, right? Everything is great is the politics of inevitability. Everything is our fault, you know, can be a form of the politics of eternity, right? We take responsibility for everything and therefore we do nothing. Um, it, it, what it is about is seeing Europe, he, European history and global history together. Um, that's, that's what it's fundamentally about. I've learned a lot and I um, think I speak on everybody's behalf. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. Thank you, Professor Snyder. Thank you, Elko. Thank you, all of us, for joining us. Um, many disheartening things have been said this evening. Really? One of the heartening things is that there are institutions That's like really the Bali, like John Adams Institute, which bring the best and brightest minds of America to the Netherlands, such as Professor Snyder. And I'm grateful for your having shared your insights with us. If you'd like to know more about what we do and come to some of our upcoming events this Sunday, uh, we're showing, uh, in collaboration with IDFA, the International Documentary Film Festival, we're showing Errol Morris's film uh, on and with Steve Bannon. So Steve Bannon, as far as I know, is not here in person. Uh, but the film is and the director is, 5.30 in Carré. On December 6th, we have our post-election event this year with a uh, conservative, Frank Luntz, as a pollster and a Fox commentator, together with a young black Democrat, Darius Baxter. And um, I hope they'll have it out. On December 11th, our last event of this year, Michael Pollan, who has this time not written about food, but about psychedelics. <clears throat> his book is called How to Change Your Mind, and his moderator will be Damien Denise, the head of psychiatry at the IMC Hospital. We're now going to buy Professor Snyder's book and have it signed. And those of us who have, and those of us who are not, will have a beer together outside. Come back soon. Uh, yes, I, I could mention Christian Amapur, but I don't want to make all the people sad who've missed the tickets because it's sold out. Thank you, Henri. But the queen of CNN is also joining the John Adams on November 30th. Uh, come back soon, bring a friend, tell them about us. Thanks very much.